of 19 is now in session. The Honorable Alan Earl is presiding. You may be seated. Good morning, Your Honor. Or good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, let me call the case first, guys. Uh, this is case number A675642, David Stilwell, an individual, versus the Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs Association et al. Um, I now like appearances of counsel for the record. Thank you, Your Honor. Travis Berry for Mr. Stilwell. Nick Crosby on behalf of the Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs Association, and with me is Robert Roshak with the association. Your Honor, Shelby sent me an email. Um, Adam Honey from the Attorney General's Office that represents the state of Nevada Department of Public Safety is no longer in the case and will not be appearing today. Mr. Barrick, uh, I've had the opportunity to read the verified complaint and um, the answer and all of the um, points and authorities. Um, I have a couple of questions to begin with. May I, should I remain seated, Your Honor? Um, no. Okay. Stand up. Um, number one. There was a list that was to be published as of yesterday. Has that list been published? No, as a matter of fact, Your Honor, and I have a copy of an email from the Department of Public Safety. May I approach? Mm -hmm. Defendant, uh, one of the defendants in this case, is going to have a meeting during July and then determine um, whether they're going to approve the list. I'm clearly out of time, Your Honor. That statute says it's July 1. On or before. Correct. Um, this is not a critical question, but uh, when is the list going to be published? I'm sorry, Your Honor, did you ask when will the list be published? Mm -hmm. I believe that um, the, uh, if the Sheriff's and Chiefs agree to meet on this proposed list, um, at that point they would discuss the list presented to them. I don't know when that time frame is. Uh, perhaps Mr. Roshak could answer that question. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Bob Roshak, Nevada Sheriff's and Chiefs. The meeting is scheduled for July 25th. statute requires that the department will issue the list on July 1st. Mm -hmm. uh, that time requirement doesn't apply to the, sheet, the chiefs. It's impossible. You know, I'm sorry. Which uh, department are we talking about? I believe that's defined, Your Honor, in uh, 202 3653 subsection 2. Department means the Department of Public Safety. Now, does the Department of Public Safety in Nevada 
publish a list without running it by the um, Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs Association. I guess the, the term published, the, the department creates the list and sends it to the Sheriffs and Chiefs Association. I think pragmatically after that, provided that they're, uh, what the Sheriffs and Chiefs review it, then it gets published after that. So I think the answer would be no, they do not publish a list, a final list, without first sending it to the Sheriffs and Chiefs. My next question is, if the Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs Association determines that they want to strike a state that had permanent that had previously been approved. Pick New Jersey, for example. I don't know whether they're approved or not. Probably not. But let's assume they were. And the Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs Association says, you know what, we don't want to approve them anymore. Um, would New Jersey come out on the list of states that were recognized or not? I do not believe so, Your Honor, no. Right. Your Honor, there would be debate on the issue. Uh, previously, when the sheriffs and chiefs have requested a state be removed, they re provided documentation as to why they felt so, sent it to DPS for them to make the final decision. Why is it that the Department of Public Safety says they don't make the final decision? That your organization does. Uh, Your Honor, that was done in 2007 during a legislative session when that portion of the bill was drafted. So how have things changed? Pardon me, Your Honor? So how have things changed? I'm sorry, sir, I don't understand the question. <clears throat> Well, here is the question. Who has the final decision-making authority on which states Nevada approves a concealed weapons permit and which states they don't? Who decides that? I think, Your Honor, if you look at the actual statute, the requirement and the obligation is on the department itself. Um, it, it is the, the public agency required to create the list, provide the list, um, and it states uh, under subsection C of 202-3689, uh, 1C, it says, prepare list of states that meet the requirements of paragraphs A and B. A state may not be included in the list unless the Sheriff's and Chiefs Association agrees with the department that the state should be included in the list. Um, the, me the mechanism essentially is, yes, the Sheriff and Chiefs have involvement with respect to uh, what states, uh, whether or not those standards from those states meet the recommendations from the association, but ultimately it starts and ends with the Department of Public Safety. They create the list and they are the final publishers of the list. Your Honor, may I respond? Sure. In, uh, on the Nevada Department of Public Safety, DPS own letterhead, letter uh, July 27, 2009, response to Florida. It's in the exhibit to our original complaint. I'm looking at it. The final decision rests with the Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs Association. And I believe further, Your Honor, there was an exhibit that we attached an email correspondence between um, the Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs and the staff at the Department of Public Safety, who, where it was agreed that it was the Sh Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs that would make the announcement. It was more appropriate to be done on Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs than the head of the Department of Public Safety. I read that too. Well, I have uh, sidetracked things, um, but a couple of questions. Um, Mr. Barrick, what does your client do for a living? He is a, owns a small trucking company.
Does he participate in interstate commerce? Yes, I believe he does. This is your motion. It is, Your Honor. You have the floor. Thank you, Your Honor. Appreciate the uh, preliminary questions because they get right to the heart of the issue. May the legislature delegate the sovereign power of the state to a nonprofit entity? And of course, we think that's so far outside the pale of delegation doctrine that there really isn't any uh, case law on the point. But we'll get to that. First of all, Your Honor, Mr. Stillwell does have a Nevada CCW permit, which means he has passed the training, the schooling, the background check. He's considered a upstanding enough citizen by the Clark County Sheriff to have been issued a CCW. This case isn't about those other thorny issues around guns like preemption or registration. It's nothing to do with that. And in fact, the real issue is not even so much that it's about guns, it's about this impermissible delegation of the sovereign power of the state. Most states issue CCW permits to their citizens under a patchwork of regulations. Um, general requirements are standard, but they're certainly not all states have the identical requirements. The bottom line is that most states want the right people to have uh, guns for their own protection or to participate in their own self-defense. Things get a little complicated though when a citizen of one state leaves his home state <coughs> and goes to another state. And then the question is, is his CCW from his home state good in the other state? And to make that happen, most states spend a fair amount of time checking on the CCW requirements to see if their CCW requirements are recognized by the other state and should they recognize the other state's CCWs. And each state has a list of the states that they recognize. Some use reciprocity, meaning we'll show you ours if you show us yours. And Florida is one of those states. Nevada is one of the states that does not have reciprocity, but it goes by recognition regime. And that's where this case got started because Mr. Stillwell has a Nevada CCW, and it was recognized in Florida in 2009, and the Nevada Sheriff's in Chief voted to take Florida off its list, off the Nevada list. Nevada was, I mean, Florida was somewhat disappointed and wrote letters to the Department of Public Safety said, how come uh, we're being taken off the list? Yeah, I noticed that came from the Department of Agriculture. Yeah. I found that unusual. It, that's true, and it is. A, there's no standardized uh, um, methodology for determining CCWs, partly because it's a state issue and not federally regulated. So it does change over time. And uh, Mr. Stillwell is disappointed because he couldn't use his CCW in Florida for his annual trip to Daytona, so of course, he wanted to know how Nevada made its decision. So it is research. He's an above average citizen, I would say, Your Honor. And he sent Nora requests to Department of Public Safety and the Nevada Sheriff's and Chiefs when he located in the statute the provision that gives them the veto power over DPS decisions. DPS has responded to every request that Mr. Stillwell submitted in a cooperative, a timely manner. And if they were unable to produce documents immediately, they sent him a note saying, hey, uh, it's going to take us a while, but we'll get it to you. Could you refine your request? So DPS was working with Mr. Stillwell and in the, if he needed to refine his request to narrow it so that it was not uh, too broad. Yeah, but they're clearly under the statute. It's the Department of Public Safety. Yes. They don't have the option of saying, no, you can't come and look at our record. Well, that's true, Your Honor. In, in, in law, they certainly don't. Uh, there, is some, um, there are some agencies that don't appreciate uh, 
these kind of public record, records requests, and they can kind of tend to give the citizen the hand, but certainly DPS has not been that way. They've been very forthright, forthcoming. By way of their response to our petition for peremptory writ, the Nevada Sheriff's and Chiefs claims, in the absence of a contract, they're not uh, subject uh, to the disclosure requirements at 239. And we disagree on several levels. First of all, their disclosure requirements arise from the provision of public services. They provide a service to the public by way of the decision making that they engage in. Secondly, their obligation arises under those exact statutes to, uh, that are at play here, the ones that give them sovereign power of the state. Their obligations are right to disclose under there. And if you, I mean, <laughs> as you saw in our reply since 2005, Nevada Sheriff's and Chief does have a contract with DPS. Well, they have a memorandum of understanding. There it is, Ron. I mean, you can construe that as a contract, I guess. It's certainly not, there's certainly not a black hole of nothingness. There is something, there is a writing signed by all the members on their letterhead, so there is a contract. It's, it would be straining language for the Nevada sheriffs and chief to suggest that all they do is make advisory decisions to the Department of Public Safety when we have the DPS in at least two occasions stating very clearly that Nevada sheriffs and chiefs do have the final say. Council, your client's request would have a lot more punch to it. If by the actions taken um, by the Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs Association had created a situation where when he went to Florida to get his concealed weapons permit, they said, well, you know what, because Nevada told us they weren't going to recognize ours, we're not going to let you get one. Well, that doesn't happen anywhere that we're aware of in the country, Your Honor. Citizens can apply for CCWs in other states, and so uh, I'm not aware of a situation where a state says, well, because Nevada cut us off, we're not going to let you get one. So I'm not aware that, yeah, that would be much more punchy. We'd look, we wouldn't want that to And it would have a lot more urgency to it. Certainly, but the, the, the standing is, issue is still there. He did, he was going to go to Florida and use a CCW, had to get one from Florida because Nevada's was no longer recognized by Florida. So that's a good point. As far as we know, that doesn't happen anywhere in the country, which is a good thing. The, the Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs tried to rely on that 2009 AG opinion. As we pointed out, sorry, no longer applicable. And the precise point was raised in the amendments in 2011 that said the provision of public services by. So whether they are providing public services under a contract, under a pattern, under the authority delegated by the statute, they're stuck, Your Honor. The simple question for today is which way does the Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs want to go? Do they want to be a public entity subject to Nevada Public Records Act requests, Nevada Open Meetings Law, or do they want to give up this authority? They can't have it both ways, Your Honor. Submit it. Unless you have any further questions. Mm, they probably will. Uh, one of the things, Council, that you want me to do is something that very few district court judges do, and that is declare that the legislature passed statutes that are unconstitutional and they are to be stricken. You rarely get that on in front of a district court judge. For Historically, that's a job for the Supreme Court. You are our only portal to the Supreme Court to decide, to decide this case. And frankly, Your Honor, the odds are it's going to end up there either way, right? Because it is such a rare thing to happen, but you are our only avenue. There is no other door upon which we can knock and challenge what we think is a completely impermissible delegation of the sovereign power. The delegation doctrine 
the case law in the Ninth Circuit, there's hardly any in Nevada, is focused entirely on the delegation of discretionary functions by an agency to a sub-agency. And that is severely limited. It can only be ministerial functions, keeping track of lists and whose licenses do and did they pay. But as far as deciding whether somebody gets a license, that's never permitted, right? So we're talking about inter-agency delegation. And that is severely restricted. And here, the legislature went outside any relevant case law and said, we're going to give our power to a nonprofit. Council, I'm <clears throat> sure as we're both standing and sitting here, Mr. Crosby, in a couple of minutes, is going to stand up and say, they didn't give us anything. They gave the Department of Public Safety the authority to do this. We just help them. Or something equivalent to that. He's got a statute to argue around, Your Honor. It shall not be on the list unless the sheriffs and chiefs put it on the list. A firearm safety course shall not be used by any sheriff unless it comports with the list of the standards produced by the sheriffs and chiefs. That's it would be a stretch, Your Honor, to, for that to be read any other way. And it clearly the intent of the legislature at the time, and we don't have all the legislative intent or the discussions that went on, but the, the Nevada sheriffs and chiefs have been trolling for this authority for a long time. Prior to their involvement, it was the Attorney General's office that advised the Department of Public Safety. The people's lawyer advised the people's agency. So they can say, all we do is advise, they got to argue around the plain language of the statute, which I think gives you solid grounds to rule it unconstitutional and let us take it up or let them take it up. Or they can bail. They, they, don't, they can let it go, make a choice. We'll, we, we're willing to settle with them, Your Honor. Or they also have to argue around the DPS saying, the final say is with the Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs. That's a tough one to get around. And even the idea that, that it's published by the Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs and not by DPS. All the press releases making the announcement are all on the Sheriffs and Chiefs letter. Those are just the three biggies, Your Honor. Could you give me the exact um, statute you want me to declare in the Constitution? Yes, sir. It is 2002, NRS 202. Point three six five seven and two thousand two oh two three six eight nine. And if you want, Your Honor, we can certainly supply a draft of the it's a simple strikeout. There simply doesn't have to be this kind of uh, delegation. The DPS, the statute itself would re make perfect sense if that one phrase was taken out in each location. There's no requirement. What was the um, latest itera iteration of these statutes? Your Honor, I don't know when they were last uh, amended. I don't have that in front of me. I apologize. Uh, I, wait, wait a second. Yeah. Uh, Your Honor, I don't have that in front of me. Yeah, we think, it, we think they've been there, remained the same since 07, Your Honor. We're not aware, of, at least at standing here, I'm not aware of any amendments since the time when these statutes were amended to give them. Mr. Uh, is there Crosby is pointing out something in 2011, but I don't know what was changed. Uh, well, it had to be amended because there is no section 3659 in my statute book. As of two. Is that an old statute book here? <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> I now have to look up. Uh, Mr. Crosby's got a copy. I don't know if he wants to share it with the court. Yeah. I have to look up the new one. For the court's uh, record, it, it appears that NRS. 2023657 had amendments in 2011. And hmm. Well, that doesn't fit. 
3689, its last amendment, uh, uh, based on me printing this today, was 2005. And I understand that the statute itself uh, was changed this legislative session under Senate Bill 76. But I don't have, I don't have that Senate Bill handy. You know. Just a moment. I think I may have. <coughs> If the court would like some supplemental briefing on it, we'd be more than glad to uh, produce um, the various iterations of the bill with track changes. Interestingly enough, I have 202.3689. I don't have 202.3659. Oh, it's 57, Your Honor. Did I misspeak? It makes I, I all the difference in the world. I can read, I, I promise. Three, three, six, five, seven. It's uh, three, six, five, okay, seven. I have that one. So okay. where's the language you want me it's to strike It's in the subparagraph three C two. This is the one regarding the firearm safety court. Successfully completed a course in firearm safety offered by a federal, state, or local law enforcement agency, community college, university, or national organization that certifies instructors in firearm safety. What's wrong with that? Um, I believe the language says that the courses cannot be uh, utilized by a sheriff unless they've been approved by the sheriffs and chiefs. Again, I don't have the statute. Do you have it, Mr. Prosper? Um, yes, Your Honor, I don't think that's exactly what it says if you read the statute. I think what Mr. Barrick is referring to, Your Honor, is the portion that st starts under 3C2, which states a sheriff may not approve a course in firearm safety pursuant to subparagraph 1 unless the sheriff determines that the course meets any standards that are established by the Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs Association or if the Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs Association ceases to exist, its legal successor. I believe that's the language Mr. Barrett's referring to. That is precisely it. I saw it quoted. I'd just like to see it in the statute books. Appreciate that. May I comment about that particular statute, Your Honor? Sure. The defendants are, or the respondents are going to suggest that it's the sheriff that determines whether the course uh, meets the standards. And that's all fine and good. But his only choices. The only courses that he can approve are ones that meet the standards set by the sheriffs and chiefs. There's lots of entities out there for fire, firearm safety courses, but the sheriff's choices are prescribed. There is no option for that sheriff to pick a course outside the standards set by the sheriffs and chiefs. Now, while that's a little bit more indirect, that's in more indirect or less direct than the statute on the CCW list. It has the same effect. That sheriff has no option to go outside the parameters set by the Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs. So you're telling me that if Sheriff Gillespie decided that this organization provided um, a list of safety courses that he didn't approve of, that he's bound by those? That's what it reads like to us, Your Honor. And that he wouldn't change that? Well, can we pick a different sheriff? How about Lyon County, right? So Lyon County 
rural county, the sheriff there goes, I've only got three people in my county offering safety courses, right? I can't use any of them if they don't meet the criteria set by the Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs. Yes, but we're not in Lyon County. Neither is your client. But this law is statewide. And it's unconstitutional, unconstitutional statewide, Your Honor. It's not even that its effect is only felt in the rural counties, Your Honor. The point is, this is an impermissible delegation to the sheriffs and chiefs to set the standard and the only standard that a local sheriff can use. That perhaps it was inartful drafting on the part of the legislature. That's never happened before. <laughs> Don't take me there. <laughs> Not a good thing. All right. Let's hear from the other side. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, a couple of things. I think it probably around around the board here. With respect to the memorandum of understanding that was identified, I believe it was Exhibit Two to the petitioner's uh, reply brief. I think it's worth noting that a that is not a contract with Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs. In fact, if you look at the last page before all the signature pages, all it states is that the Sheriffs and Chiefs shall be the communication representative for the 15 sheriffs and chiefs. It's not, a, it's not a contract with the association, which we've established, and I don't think that Mr. Barrick's client is going to disagree that Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs is a nonprofit. So with respect to a privatized contract, that is not a privatized contract. And I think um, with respect to a privatized contract under NRS Chapter 239, uh, that contemplates when, for example, a public entity like the city of the county hires a private contractor to potholes. Um, that's certainly, you're spending taxpayer dollars to do uh, maintain a public service, which would be a road, and certainly that would be contemplated under the transparency notions under NORA. This is not a contract with Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs. It is Sheriffs and Chiefs specifically, by definition in that MOU, is just the communication representative for those 15 of or Sheriffs and Chiefs who signed on to that MOU. And of note, that was from 2005. But more importantly, I think what we have to look at, Mr. Barrett, was discussing the constitutionality of the statute. Uh, I, to my knowledge, the Nevada Department of Public Safety has not been dismissed from this lawsuit. Um, I haven't seen a stipulation for dismissal that's been filed. Mr. Barrett didn't see one that was been filed, correct? Well, there was one flying around, Your Honor, and I don't remember whether we executed. It. I know there and was one flying around. I think around. it's important because the Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs Association doesn't saddle the burden of defending the constitutionality of the state statutes. That's the purview of DPA, or the Attorney General's office. So, and if you look on um, cause of action one. Well, counsel, um, the plaintiff knows whether or not they've dismissed the state, don't you? Uh, and yes, we have not dismissed the state. There was a, cir a stipulation circulated. I don't believe we ever executed. Certainly not letting them out, but only as far as, what was that about? Uh, I, I believe it was contemplating letting DPS out of the case, but that no, was no, 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 no never all the way out because they can't be dismissed for a constitutional challenge and that was the problem they wanted out it was out for the print but it was irrespective of that the fact is it's not been signed filed there and out of this case and I think what's this case has been noticed as the motion for peremptory writ is what's before this court today if you look under cause of action one the peremptory writ has no constitutional challenge that does that's not contained in the cause of action one which is the actual the actual writ the second cause of action is the declaratory relief action, which would be subject or encompassing the constitutionality. So I don't think today before this court is appropriate. Me, oh, I'm so sorry, Miss. Thank you. Um, I don't think today before this court is the constitutionality of that of those two statutes. Nor do I think that it's the Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs Association obligation to defend the constitutionality of those statutes. And third, um, in case the record miss it, I'm not aware that the uh, Department of Public Safety was dismissed from this action in any way, shape, or form, or otherwise relieved of their obligation to defend the constitutionality of that statute. If I well, may, if they're not here to defend it, the decision's pretty easy. Thank you, Your Honor. Would, would it be permissible to ask the court clerk to check the docket? Because I don't I think there was already a, printed it. Is there an entry, Your Honor? There's. It was filed uh, May 1st. It was signed by the Nevada Sheriff's and Chiefs Association. What is it exactly? It's, it is a stipend, stipend order to dismiss state respondents 
only as to the first cause of action, the issuance of a preemptory writ. Sorry, right. Okay. Good. So, and, okay, and, the, and, the, and my correction, I didn't think we filed that, but the preemptory writ does not deal with the constitutionality of the statute, which is what was argued today. But I think let's take a look at the statute itself, and we were talking about one of the provisions that council addressed would be 202.365 uh, section, subsection 3, sub subsection C2, which states that a sheriff may not approve a course in firearm safety pursuant to subparagraph 1 unless the sheriff determines that the course meets any standards that are established by Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs Association or if Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs Association ceases to exist, its legal successor. Council was discussing the plain language of the statute as a basis both for declaring that the association is a public entity or a quasi-public entity, but also in, in sounding uh, a bit more uh, focused on the constitutionality or unconstitutionality of that statute. And let's look first to the plain language of the statute. It states that a sheriff may not approve a course in firearm safety pursuant to subaircraft one unless the sheriff determines that the course meets any standards that are established by the Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs Association. So while I, uh, I certainly can see the argument that from a pragmatic standpoint that is what happened or happens, but the reality is the way the statute is written, the sheriff has the de determination whether or not to approve a course in firearm safety. It's his determination whether or not it meets standards that are published by Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs Association. Um, I, don't, I disagree with Mr. Barrick, obviously, that the plain language of that statute means he cannot approve a course in firearm safety. If he determines that a course meets those standards, whether he's wrong, right, or she's wrong or right, it's within his purview under that particular statute to approve that course in firearm safety. And if you look to further provisions within 202, you'll look 202-3657-C1. Uh, it's the course is approved by the sheriff. Um, permits are issued by the sheriff. The Association Acts essentially is it publishes standards that it thinks are appropriate, which provides consistency for the state in issuing concealed weapons licenses. Um, it's, in order to secure a writ, Mr. Stiller needs to have a clear legal right to what he's seeking. Um, the DPS, I would expect, would respond to public records requests. They are a public entity by definition of the statute. Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs is not a public entity. That is not disputed by Mr. Stilwell. What we're arguing about is whether or not Sheriffs and Chiefs provide some quasi-public function which su would subject it to Chapter 239. I, I do not think that the uh, plaintiff or the petitioner here has a clear legal right which is required under Buckingham to get a writ at this juncture. I don't, that's not to say, and I've had discussions with Mr. Barrett, it's not to say I don't see um, the issues presented, uh, but I don't think that Mr. Stilwell has a clear legal right, which is the standard, to secure a peremptory writ. And furthermore, I think that it would be inappropriate for this court to address the constitutionality of those two statutes and strike any portion or modify any portion, considering what is on motion today is the peremptory writ, which does not address the constitutionality of that statute. It only addresses whether or not Department or a Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs Association should be regarded as providing some public service, thereby subjecting it to Chapter 239. Furthermore, um, because the petitioner has requested the same in the event that he is uh, prevails on the claim with respect to 239 or 202 for that matter. There are two immunity statutes contained in both of those doctrines which immunize people or entities who in good faith um, challenged the public records request. For example, if you look to uh, 239.012, um, there is a good, if a entity relies on good faith to disclose or not disclose in a request for public records, they are immune from civil liability. Likewise, in 202.3683, there is an immunity which arguably is, is a bit more attenuated uh, given the role that sheriffs and chiefs plays, but it does say that they, uh, a state or political subdivision of the state, the department, a sheriff, law enforcement agency, 
firearm safety or training instructor or any person who, in good faith and without gross negligence, acts pursuant to provisions of NRS 202.3653 to 202.369 inclusive is immune from civil liability for those acts. Such acts include, but are not limited to, the receipt, review, or investigation of an application for permit, the certification of a retired law enforcement officer, or the issuance, denial, suspension, revocation, or renewal of a permit. So we have two, two statutes which both provide, if a party is in good faith, believes it is not subject to the parameters of those statutes, they are not, I mean, they isn't, are that a, isn't that an issue that would come up? after this decision is made? Absolutely, and I would just put it on there for the record since counsel in, in the last part of his uh, first cause of action, which is the peremptory writ, asked for attorney's fees. I'm just uh, attempting to be uh, conclusive with respect to my presentation to the court. But at the end of the day, what we do have is a private, nonprofit organization that is not funded by taxpayer dollars. Um, it does not receive taxpayer money. It does not do any public service function other than make recommendations on uh, training standards for instructors uh, for concealed weapons firing. It provides some uh, guidance or, you know, lighthouse, if you will, for agencies to view uh, training that they in turn approve to get applications to or coursework or that the NDPS issues that list. And granted, there is, you know, I will be candid with the court, there is a, a, a bit of gray area with respect to how that statute reads. But I don't think that the way it is contemplated by the legislature, I don't think the way it's handled by the Sheriff's and Chiefs Association warrants designating the association as a public entity. And furthermore, the extent to which the Sheriff's and Chiefs Association is a public entity becomes pertinent. Because if this is 1% of what Sheriff's and Chiefs do with respect to providing a public function, does that mean now everything that the Sheriff's and Chiefs do becomes subject to 239 and 241? I don't think so because that would be the same as if QMD Construction did 6th Street for a block on a public contract. They don't, a, a party does not get to open the books of QMD Construction because they performed one function, one public service. And I think that's important to keep note that this is not designated an entire agency or association as a public agency, a quasi public agency or public body. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Crosby. Anything else? All right, yes, Your Honor. In reverse order, Mr. Stilwell doesn't need everything, all documents and records pertaining to the activities of the sheriffs and chiefs. He wants to know how they decide, how did they vote, because they do take a vote on each and every state, and so he believes he's entitled to know how they voted on that. Um, there's no immunity available to the Nevada sheriffs and chiefs because those statutes were civil liability. This isn't about civil liability. This is about attorney's fees provided for under the statute if Mr. Stilwell has to employ counsel to go get this stuff. The statute says he's entitled to his fees, and so this isn't about civil liability. Counsel, the statute says a court may. And we would... It doesn't say it has to. I understand that, Your Honor. You, we're entirely at your mercy on that point. Um, Just so we're clear. Excuse me? I said, just so we're clear. I understood, Your Honor. But that was a remedy that the legislature intended, because otherwise there's no way for the average citizen to pry into the uh, bowels of government to get information that is rightfully to be disclosed. And so there has to be some sort of uh, in, uh, empowerment of the average citizen to make these kind of requests. Um, Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs doesn't publish CCW standards that the DPS uses to decide. It's just the opposite, Your Honor. It's the DPS that has some sort of standard out there, which is the subject of a current uh, information request right now. What are those standards that you use to judge the states that you're going to recommend to the Sheriffs and Chiefs? Well, we haven't got that. But that's how it works. If anybody publishes standards, it's not those guys. Your Honor, the peremptory writ is asking for an order for them to produce or respond to a Nevada Open Records Act request specifically on the subject at issue here. How do they decide? In 2009, I believe Florida and Utah were kicked off the list. And since those are reciprocity states, they reciprocated and kicked Nevada off their list. So now, a citizen can't use a CCW. 
Lastly, Your Honor. In Florida. In Utah. You can't use a Nevada CCW on either of those states, Your Honor. Right, but you can use it in at least 10 or 11 others. Yeah. Oh, it does in Utah. Utah Utah's a uh, recognition state. Sorry, the, a fine point that is not exactly the point, Your Honor, is, but if you want to, I'll, I'll clarify it with Mr. Stilwell. The point is, uh, Mr. Stilwell and the citizens of the state, the media, anybody that asks should be entitled to find out how the sheriffs and chiefs goes about making decisions, one, which they're three weeks late on currently. Lastly, Your Honor, about the memorandum of understanding, if, if, if you could turn to that, Your Honor, there's an interest, very interesting uh, uh, language. Just a minute, it's going to take me a second to find it. What exhibit is it? It's, it should not go unnoticed that it's on Nevada Sheriff's and Chief's letterhead. It's exhibit two, Your Honor, of petitioner's reply brief. And if you look at, uh, on the top of page two, it is hereby agreed Three lines down, four lines down. Hmm. What was that attached to? That was attached, that was attached to, to our reply. Huh? Yeah, it was to our reply. It was probably the last filing in the case. Just a moment. That's fine. It was towards the end. second page of the MOU, the top paragraph, four lines down. The consequence of failing to do so comply with the terms below. By a county sheriff will mean losing their ability to issue permits to carry concealed firearms that are... <laughs> do I need to continue, Your Honor? <laughs> you can do that to a uh, civilly elected sheriff? <laughs> I'm not sure you can. <laughs> See where we're going? And look down here at the, in its further agreed, Your Honor. The DPS agrees to limit all contact to the sheriffs and chiefs. They're not allowed to negotiate or operate or contact individual sheriffs. So to say this isn't a contract, Your Honor, is, I don't know. My wife's studying for the bar, so we're going through contracts 101. This is it, Your Honor. So, Your Honor, we asked the court to order the Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs to respond to Mr. Stilwell's NORA request, the one that he did, or any subsequent one that he makes, and pay his attorney's fees. In the alternative... Out of curiosity, what are your attorney's fees? I, you know, I don't know, Your Honor. I don't have it in front of me. I would, I would guess I have... You can't guess, counsel. I... If you request attorney's fees, you got to give me something in writing. That's true, Your Honor. I didn't pre prepare an order, but I will. I'll submit a memorandum. That's assuming a grant. I uh, was hoping I, you'd be able to tell me what you were requesting. What, how would that change, Your Honor, my entitlement to fees? It might not. <laughs> I just want the information. Well, it, my average rate's two fifty an hour, and I would guess that I have less than a hundred hours, so it'd be less than twenty five G's on the case. I would. That's just twenty five thousand on this case. Yeah, I le I think I have less than a hundred hours. You want a memorandum of fees and costs? You have at it. I should. I, we we would certainly uh, take any scraps that the court would throw our way.
The court does have that alternative remedy, and I, I'm sorry that the, Nevada, the uh, Attorney General is not here. About that um, stipulation, thank you, that we did uh, recall once we were reminded of it, that was simply to excuse the DPS from having to respond to the peremptory writ because they have complied. At every turn, DPS has responded to Mr. Stilwell's um, uh, information requests. Well, the end result is that the Attorney General isn't here, and I'm not happy about that. Yeah, I, 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 they didn't tell me they weren't coming. Not only did we publish a notice, I emailed it to both uh, respondent councils as an attachment. Is that correct? Yeah. So not only did they get to publish notice, they got uh, actual email notice. If I may briefly respond, Your Honor. Microphone, please. Sure. If I may briefly respond, Your Honor. I want everybody to be able to say what they think they have to tell me. I think it's worth noting that Mr. Barrick stated that when I discussed the issue of essentially the uh, what is the intended or unintended consequences of designating the association as a public entity and essentially opening up all aspects of this association as designating it a public agency, um, Mr. Barrick, I believe, responded that he's only looking out for the concealed weapons, the votes on the concealed weapons list. And I think if you turn to it's exhibit A of the actual verified petition. What Mr. Stillwell requested on January 24th, 2012, which is the operative NOR request is number one, all correspondence by mail, fax, email, instant message, or any other communication between all members of DPS, the de department, and anyone representing Nevada Sheriff's and Chiefs Association. Number two, the full list of NSCA members and the organization they belong to prior to the Sheriff's and Chiefs Association. Number three, all accountants' copies of the NVSCA books for the last two years. Number four, a complete list of the NVSCA members who were registered as lobbyists in the state of Nevada for the last two sessions, period. There was no request for concealed weapons license votes, considerations for concealed weapons license notes. He is looking to open every aspect of the association. This case did not start out as a concealed weapons issue. It started out as, I want all your books and communications of the heads of these agencies. So I think it's somewhat disingenuous to argue that all he's looking for is concealed weapons information on reciprocity lists or recognition lists when the operative January 24, 2012 letter mentions nothing about a concealed weapons license or a list. And if we're talking about Contracts 101, we look, who are the parties of the contract? Nevada Sheriff's Chief is not listed as a, a, a party. And second, the sentence that Mr. Barrett read is the consequence of failing to do so by a county sheriff, not an association, who mean losing their ability to issue permits to carry concealed firearms that are recognized as alternatives to NICS background checks. It was a function of interplay between Brady background checks, not with actually issuing permits, but it's irrelevant in my opinion for the NOR request issue because this speaks nothing about the association curtailing or providing any rights to that association, it addresses the sheriff, which 202, 3657 is what states, who, st who gets to issue permits? The sheriff, not the association. Thank you. If I may, Your Honor, the f Mr. Uh, Mr. Crosby exactly right about Mr. Stilwell's initial request. It was overbroad. And the Nevada Sheriff's and Chief's response was, hey, your request is overbroad. Can you narrow it down for us? We don't have to give you everything. Tell us what you really want. Did they say that? No, they said, we don't have to reply. So DPS has uh, worked with Mr. Stilwell to narrow his request. So he's a citizen. He, he asked for too much. That doesn't excuse them from responding and saying, what exactly are you looking for, right? So I think that that's uh, their claim that it would be it would be required to turn over everything is ridiculous. They could say, if they're ordered to respond, Mr. Stillwell can send them a new one, or they can say, Mr. Stillwell, we've been ordered to respond. What exactly are you looking for? That's that interplay. But to somehow say that an overbroad request out the gate somehow blocks his ability to ask, I think is 
incorrect and un contrary to the intent of the statute. So, the de but Nevada sheriffs and chiefs didn't say, you're asking for too much, this is crazy. What are you asking for? I can respond. I think the court gets it, but uh, re request for relief number one under the uh, verified complaint is respond to the NOR request that I read the January 24th. It's the specific request for relief, A. And B, the sheriffs and chiefs do not have to respond with your request is overbroad because they don't have, in their opinion, based upon the statute, an obligation to respond whether it be, you know, give me the first line of the very first email that you've ever sent versus everything you have. It is not a covered entity. Thank you. If I may, Mr. Stewart will ask me to explain to the court the genesis of that first request, if it's of still interest to the court. Uh, Mr. Stewart went to a Nevada Sheriff's and Chiefs meeting, and wasn't it the Sawyer Building? Yeah. Sawyer Building. And um, it was on the CCW issue, and was basically informed that uh, he was there at their pleasure, and they're like the United Way, and they don't really aren't accountable to the public, so he generated, in his mind, he generated a broad request to see what he would get from them. So if that's of any interest, he asked me to explain that to the court. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nothing further from me, Your Honor. Submitted. Here's the ruling. The request for the court to declare NRS 202.3657 and NRS 202.3689 unconstitutional is denied. The reason primarily is that it's not an issue before the court today. <clears throat> also, if you read those statutes carefully, I don't think they're unconstitutional on their face. We get to the much m more um, troublesome issue, and that is um, does the Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs Association, even though they are a private entity, perform public service and are therefore subject to the Nevada Open uh, Records Act? After a careful careful consideration of the written materials and oral argument, which I always request and enjoy. It is my feeling that the Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs Association is in fact a private entity that does in fact provide public service and is therefore subject to the Nevada um, Open Records Act. <clears throat> Having said that, I can tell you, Mr. Barrick, that if this records request were brought before me in some kind of motion, I would strike it. This is a private organization. It's not a public agency of the state of Nevada. 
they may provide some public services and what your client is entitled to is information that deals with concealed weapons permits how those decisions are made when they were made who makes them the process by which they're made in my opinion um, your client's not entitled to a full membership list and a list of all the organizations that the members belong to. And an accountant's copy of the books for the last two years? I don't think so. You're entitled to what this case is about. And that is, I can't go to Florida and use my Nevada concealed weapons permit. I had to go there and get my own. It cost me $350 in two days of work. For that, you don't get to dive into the records of a private nonprofit organization and get every piece of information they may have some of which may be highly confidential. So, redo your request. Yes, sir. And narrow it significantly along the guidelines that I've issued. Or, both of you can take this case up to the Supreme Court. You, to question my decision on whether your client is a, is a private agency that is doing um, public services and you on the narrowness of what I'm going to allow. There are appealable issues. If I may, Your Honor. The, um, I think Mr. Crosby and I agree that the second cause of action really wasn't before the court at this time. And that the, so can we clarify that that cause of action is still live and that we can pursue that through the normal course of litigation? I think that may be the better ruling. Um, the reason I didn't take uh, an extensive look at the statutes was they weren't in front of me. And Yeah, the, the AG wasn't here. And the AG wasn't here to defend it. And it really isn't fair to talk about the constitutionality of state statutes and whether I'm going to strike them unless the AG is here to defend the legislature. Would the court be displeased if I sent the deputy a nasty gram? No. Nope. Um, and uh, if I understand the order that leaves open the possibility that Mr. Crosby and I and our clients can negotiate either a narrowly tailored nor a request or settle this part of the case. It's always better to do it that way, uh, but there are all kinds of reasons why you may want a judge to intervene, and this room was built for the purpose of having you do that. Thank you. Your Honor, uh, procedurally pers going forward on the second cause of action, would it be appropriate for the parties to hold an early case conference file a, a JCCR and pursue, pursue a discovery scheduling order. I'm not sure what discovery schedule you need. The statutes are either constitutional or not on their face. I'm just talking about procedurally so that we're not in trouble with the discovery commissioner oh. and so that we get a trial order. And you all. can certainly have a, in fact, you have to. Right. And I just um, have a um, mandatory joint case conference. But keep in mind, this is a legal issue. Understood, Your Honor. We're a question to of law. It. Yeah, we're not trying to push it out. I was just trying to comply with the, the, East, the eight judicial district rules regarding case scheduling. How do we get it moving? Because we got this hearing on because of the statute provided for a preferential hearing. Uh, but we have not had an early case conference or filed the JCCR. And so, uh, hoping that the Discovery Commission will recognize it right. I think you probably need to do that, but you better get the Attorney General involved. I know his boss. So? So do I. So what does that mean? 
Well, not his boss boss, but his immediate supervisor. I'll put in a call to Ms. Buchanan and say hello. I thought you meant the governor. No, no. <laughs> Um, Will the court prepare an order or shall Mr. Crosby and I work one up? You and Mr. Crosby are going to work this out because I'll look at it and then decide if I'm going to sign it. Fair enough, Your Honor. I'll take the laboring one. We will request a transcript so that we can get it right. Um, and the next question is. Mr. Crosby, do you want to appeal this order? Uh, I think it, it can, Your Honor. I would have to take that to my client to take to the executive board since it is a nonprofit. There's limited funds for. I'm actually doing this pro bono uh, for the association, and obviously it's a, a task I have to take to my uh, fellow partners as to whether or not we take it. I, I don't know if I'm willing to answer that question right now, um, so I don't. I guess I don't have an answer for Your Honor. Well, there's always the issue of a stay. Um, Yes. Uh, you know, my, we can issue a stay while well, Mr. Barrick and I try to work some resolution out yeah. with respect to this. Because, uh, candidly, I don't think that the constitutionality of those statutes is my my issue. Agreed. And so I, would, I don't want to be along for a ride just to be along for a ride. And it isn't your client's issue. Exactly. Correct. So, um, as far as I'm concerned with the announcement of the court, um, with respect to the decision as designating association as a private entity performing a public function and authorizing um, uh, Nora to cover uh, this limited aspect of its function, I think that we probably can reach a resolution with Mr. Barrick. Yeah. Um, but the issue is, I, you know, and I don't want to go ahead of myself, but um, I think there's still the issue. I know that Mr. Barrick has sought fees in this case, and I don't want to stop here and go to Mr. Barrick and try to reach a resolution, and then Mr. Barrick and I have a discussion about fees. And, and again, like I said, we're a nonprofit entity, and I'm not, you know, I would rather hear the court's opinion, whether whatever that is. <laughs> I don't so, know, because I don't, I, sometimes when you speak with counsel who's looking for fees, it impedes the bigger issue of resolution, which in this case seems to be the 239 request, which I think is workable. And so we'll include in the order, with your permission, Your Honor, that uh, upon the entry of the order, it will leave open the possibility of fi me filing a memorandum of fees and costs. But Mr. Uh, Crosby and I may be able to resolve that issue just between us. Well, I want to be clear. Filing a memorandum of costs denotes that the court has awarded fees and costs. Uh, I'll make it clear. I will award costs upon a verified memorandum of costs in terms of fees will you entertain a motion you can file the motion for fees and we'll argue it. fair enough I think I think the chances of, of us resolving this in the, uh, the f next upcoming stages is fairly high I think um, you should think very carefully about that. Yes, Your Honor. Costs are awarded on a, ver on a verified memorandum of costs. He can challenge that if he wants to. I understand. Under the statute, fees are another issue. I understand, Your Honor. I understood the risks when I took this case. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. This is quite interesting. And appreciate your attention to detail. Um, Are we concluded? Um, do you want a status check? Um, I don't think that'll be necessary because we're going to hold an ECC with the AG's office and file a joint case conference. And if you want to give us a status check, you want us to come back, I'll be glad to. It's I'm just saying if you gentlemen want one, I would like one because it tends to keep counsel's feet to the fire, my own included. We can do 60 days, give us a fair amount of time. Can we do 90? I've got sure. a federal court trial. I have an antelope hunt, so. Uh, yeah, uh, give him 90 days. Okay. Um, what did you want to know? He has an antelope hunt. Will that interfere with the hunt? 90 days will not. Okay. Or do you want it on a Tuesday again? No. Okay. <laughs> Put it at the end of. Uh, Civil staff. Okay, that's going to be October.
October 3rd at 9 a.m. And if it's not necessary, we'll notify the court. That yeah, can't please resolve that. Okay. Miss, did you say 9 o'clock? 9 o'clock. Thank you, Miss. <coughs> well, I'm, I'm um, that's a civil calendar, and that can last for hours. I understand that, Your Honor. Maybe you can put an asterisk by it. Maybe we can take it out of order. Maybe it won't even be necessary. Maybe it won't be necessary. You, um, I mean, when I was a lawyer, I always kept books on judges. So you now got a book on me. Um, we're decide it warms our heart. It. it warms our heart to think that we provided you with some uh, stimulation. Your <laughs> okay, we're done. Um, just a. That uh, email that we gave you, Your Honor, will that be included in the file in, in the records, or is that just is that just for the court's convenience? Um, do you want to mark it as an exhibit? It's. You need to order me, sir. Yeah, we can mark it as an exhibit. Your Honor, we move that email into evidence as an exhibit. Plain okay, exhibit. well, I've written on it. I have oh, another I copy. I can print it. All right. Yeah. I have another copy. Um, mark it as uh, exhibit what? One. One? One. Ma'am. Exhibit one. May I approach? You may.